he's out there and you can't, we have to stay back here, like away from the door. I mean, and rightfully so, he had pictures on his Facebook, his cover page was AK-47s and all of these guns and he, you know, that was another thing when I was dating him, he would kind of go on to these anti-government rants, like the kind of stuff you hear from people who go and do mass shootings. He was very anti-government, he was very anti-authority. That was like the things I was learning about him as I was dating is what scared me when we weren't together. I knew this is a person who doesn't respect authority. He doesn't care about the law. I knew he had gone to jail when I was dating him, but I didn't learn until after that it was for stalking behavior and assaulting a woman. And I was sleeping with the enemy. I, I let my worst nightmare into my house willingly. Bibi. And I'm Jake Deptula. On today's episode of Strictly Stalking, we're chatting with Brianne, who was pressured to date a former high school classmate through his series of persistent Facebook messages and texts. During their three months together, he gaslit her during conversations, disappeared for days with no word, entered her house when she wasn't home, and stole her wedding band. After discovering her bank account emptied and her house ransacked, Brianne breaks off the relationship. He immediately begins leaving her disturbing voicemail messages, sends her pictures of Hannibal Lecter with death quotes, harasses her friends online, follows her in his car, and knocks on her door late at night. She starts an online Facebook group with her friends to ask them to report any messages they receive about her and quickly discovers that her ex had independently stalked several of her friends as well. Brianne, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. How did you meet your stalker? We went to high school together, but... Our school was rather large, so I only knew of him pretty much by name, Um, and so I didn't officially have any uh, in-person contact with him until after high school, but that's where our initial kind of knowledge of one another started. How did he enter your life, basically? He added me on Facebook. I can't remember exactly when he added me, but he was always kind of a background fixture um on my Facebook just he would kind of pop up and comment and message me once in a while and that was when it started with the communication how did the communication start i think it really escalated the communicating after i got a divorce um i think there might have been some minor flirting a little bit before that but then i got a divorce and i was single and uh, living on my own. And I started kind of dating because him and I were sort of talking, but not really anything that would indicate to him that any it was going anywhere. But this kind of maybe was like a personal challenge to him because he was also a soldier at that time. And um, my intuition was just kind of like ringing, like there was nothing outwardly really wrong with him. Um, I just was getting this feeling like I'm going to put some distance between me and this guy. Like, I'm not going to date him, but he can stay on my Facebook. So I chose the other soldier and started dating him. And he um, remained on my Facebook for years after that. So that was around like 2012. And um, I mean, he would disappear for a while. And later on, I would come to find out that's when he was doing other creepy stuff with other women. He would just kind of go off the grid and then pop back up and add me again. And we kind of just had a casual friendship. He didn't really do anything after he asked me out the first time. Um, I was able to kind of lean on the fact that I was getting a divorce and my life was really messy and I just wanted to be single and not deal with stuff. Um, that didn't seem to hurt his ego. Like he didn't retaliate that time. Um, but he would make comments throughout the years pretty persistently, like, um, let's hang out, let's meet, let's do this. He would even kind of, you know, uh, me and my friend were doing this network marketing thing. And he was like, I want to meet and learn about your business. And like, he would just kind of push and find all these little avenues. And I was pretty just adamant. Like I found it like, a lot of women do this. We'll find any excuse, but we it's really hard to be assertive and just be like, I'm just not that interested because you kind of are met with backlash. And I I had kind of that feeling that he would be one of those aggressive, mean people because I'd kind of seen him comment 
on other Facebooks, but it wasn't enough to kind of make me, it was just enough to make me realize this guy has the potential to be um, combative. So I would just make excuses like I'm busy. I'm not, you know, dating right now, whatever. Um, He did stay up persistently enough though, so that by the time I was, had been in so many bad relationships and he, he just like picked the right opportunity. Like the same week I found out the guy I'd been dating, I went to his house and, and his ex-girlfriend was there at his house. Like I caught him cheating on me, like physically. Um, and it was really traumatizing and really heartbreaking. And I had had a lot of bad relationships. So my self-esteem was pretty low at that point. And he said all the right things. And I just like, I actually distinctly remember the conversation I had in my head where I was like, this is going to probably go really badly, but I'm going to give him a chance because I don't feel like I have anything left to lose. And it kind of seems like all men are not very good at this point. So I agreed to a date in that same week he came over for the first time. How long had he been pursuing you? I graduated 2006, so all the way up from 2006 to 2015, he was intermittently coming in with it gradually escalating. What was the beginning of the relationship like? It went like super fast. Um, He, like the first day he, he was planning to come over to my house and I didn't want it to be like a real date. So I had my best friend at the time kind of being there as a buffer. We were just going to have a hangout, watch movies kind of night. And he had, like, I found out after the fact he had messaged her and be like, should I tell her I love her? And I was like, why didn't you tell me that? <laughs> like, um, and that's just how it went. You know, he started telling me he loved me really quickly. He started just coming and spending every night at my house. And I, I was living by myself and very independent, but I didn't have a voice then and I didn't know how to put boundaries in place. And I didn't know how to say I'm uncomfortable with how you're invading my space, basically. He just like it's now looking back at it, everything was a manipulation tactic to get me to like to mold me to be and do exactly the things he wanted. And um, so I have talked about I talk very openly about that I'm in recovery back then I did not know that I had a substance abuse problem because I liked to drink and I was in my mid-20s so it felt like that was the thing to do but I started to kind of recognize that and be like you know I want to kind of chill with the drinking because I don't seem to be able to control my stop my stopping point and so without Uh, a doubt he would come over with alcohol every time and of course I knowing now I'm like powerless to not be able to say like you know not tonight so it was also very confusing because I kind of feel like he was using alcohol as a means to lower my um, guard and make me even more confused by the situation everything just felt so muddled and confusing because of Um, just the way he talked, the things he did, his actions didn't really meet his words. It was all very confusing. So you think he took advantage of your substance abuse problem during the time? Yeah, especially after, because he made comments, um, you know, to, to use it against me after we had broken up, he'd make comments like, oh, well, Brianne's just an alcoholic. She's just drunk. Like he would try to pit that against me. And, um, and, you know, he was definitely contributing to that. He wanted me to always have alcohol in my system. When you first started dating him, what was what were some of your conversations like? At first, it was more like the things he would say just didn't um, make a lot of sense. And with some simple digging, I could tell that it wasn't true. He, for example, told me he dated a woman in the service and that she had died in active um, on active duty, and. I found her Facebook and she was alive and I was like, "Mm, okay, that's weird. Like maybe he's lying for sympathy. He had lots of stories about women he dated before that seemed very off to me about how things had ended, um, like, like how she had died or, um, you know, there was just always a weird story behind it. The gaslighting was really in the form of when he would we would be in the middle of something. It would be like eight o'clock at night or something. We're getting ready to, you know, wind down for the night. And he'd be like, I'm going to go get cigarettes. And I'd be like, okay, like we're not fighting. Nothing's wrong. 
and an hour goes by and, and like, you know, the store's right up the road and he's not coming back. So I'm calling, he's not answering his phone. It goes into the night and nothing is, ha- I mean, I'm so paranoid and panicked that something bad has happened to him. I'm checking hospitals. I'm calling um, his mom's house phone. I'm calling, I'm looking on jail rosters. I'm doing all of this. And it wasn't like he would just like the next morning call me. He would go days. And then it was like uh, torture because he wasn't responding to me, but he would get on Facebook and like, like a picture or a status. So then the panic, like, I'm like, okay, like what is going on? Like, just tell me if you're okay or why you just disappeared. And then he would still ignore me and he'd end up calling a few days later and be like, do you want to go get a coffee? Like nothing happened. And if I even brought up like, where did you go? The gaslighting was when, you know, with him being like, well, you have too much anxiety and it stresses me out. So I just needed to step back for a second. And so it was always turning it on me, which is very wrong, like put me in this position where I felt like I had probably done something because I can't figure out why any normal person would just disappear for days at a time and not respond to you. And um, it wasn't until later looking up stuff about narcissism and how they manipulate their victims that I realized this is something they do. They put you in this state of panic so that by the time they've come back, even though they've wronged you, you're like clinging to them because you want reassurance. You want to know that everything's okay. And he knew he was doing this because my older brother has, he has passed away. And so um, I have a lot of trauma based on that. Um, You know, one minute my brother's there, the next minute I'm getting a phone call, he's gone. And I think that he was playing on that very deep rooted trauma inside of me to manipulate me. Um, Luckily, I'm a lot stronger now and that wouldn't happen nowadays, but if that was just who I was back then. You know, Jake, now that I'm single, I'm sleeping better than ever. You know, and I know why, because I'm sleeping much better as well. Of course you are, because we got our new Helix mattresses and I know I haven't slept so well in years. You know, I've been seeing a lot of selfies of you in bed lately on Instagram. Right, because when I find something I love, I want everyone to know about it. Helix Sleep makes personalized mattresses right here in the U.S. and ships straight to your door with free no-contact delivery, free returns, and a 100-night sleep trial. To choose a mattress, Helix made a quiz that takes just two minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep references to the perfect mattress for you. Whether you like to sleep on your side, on your back, or on your stomach, with Helix, there's a specific mattress for each and everybody's unique taste. I like to sleep with both my dogs and my cat in bed with me. I matched with the California King Helix Sunset Lux, and it really is pure perfection. We both love Helix, but you don't need to take our word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress of 2020 by GQ, Wired Magazine, and Apartment Therapy. And they have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you will. Right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders. Get up to $200 off at helixsleep.com slash stocking. That's helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash stocking. Take the quiz today, place your order, and get a new mattress shipped right to your door. Is there something interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? We often discuss mental health during our Strictly Stalking episodes and understand the importance of getting help when you need it. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room like you do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit BetterHelp.com slash stalking. That's Better H-E-L-P and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. 
And a special offer for Strictly Stalking listeners, you will get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash stalking. What is some of the other stuff that he would do during that time to you while you were in the relationship? He would ask me, like he would say, I want to do something romantic for you. When you're at work, can you leave me your house key? And that was, uh, he wasn't working at the time. He had broken like his whole entire arm, um, which I found out later. He told me he broke it at school. He was like in school to be um, a scuba diving um like underwater mechanic, but I found out he like went crazy and punched a wall at a bar. Um, So he wasn't working and he was like, well, I want to just, I'm going to spend my day cleaning your house and making it romantic for you. And um, I would come home and there wasn't really anything he had done. He just wanted to hang out at my house. And, and then it, um, he, he told me a few days later, like he never, he he didn't give me my key back, even though I would ask him like, remember to give me my key back. He said to me, well, I lost it. I left it at the basketball court. And that was an immediate red flag for me because I kind of started noticing things moved around my house. Even when he wouldn't tell me he was going to be at my house, you know, like I would leave my laptop on my table and then I would come home and it's not where I know I left it and I would text him and I'd be like have you seen this and he'd be like no I wasn't there and then I would find it in a place that was just enough hidden to make me panic to think it's missing but it's still at my house clearly moved it was just so much like mind games like that lots of moving stuff making things kind of disappear um you know, I did start to notice the money coming out of my bank account at first. I thought it was it was such small increments. I thought maybe I'm taking the money out and I don't remember because I would, you know, sometimes take cash out. Um, and it was it was just and I'm not, you know, I'm not unintelligent. I'm not a person that doesn't keep track of my stuff. It's just they do it in such small, sly ways that it's it's very confusing and hard to figure out what they're doing. And on top of that, they say and do, like they say all of the things to make you question because their actions aren't meeting their words. So it can be very confusing. What were some of the other things that you you know knew about him uh, during this time, if at all? And how did he present himself online? I really didn't know anything about him. Um, I knew he was in the army. And I went through a phase where I liked (laughs) army guys. Um, uh, He really kept our conversations lacking of anything super personal. It was, um, he did ask a lot of questions about me, which I liked. Um, I think that deflects from the person having the ability to ask anything about him. Um, You know, so he, he just seemed very charming and very sweet and very interested in me. How long were you dating for? We only dated for three months max. Like that has to be the absolute max amount of time that it was. And how did it end? The week that I uh, really noticed the money, the savings account, I was also going to Memphis with my sister and my mom and aunt. We do this kind of girls trip to go to Graceland during Elvis week and um, I went to go look at my savings account to pull some money out for the the trip and it was gone and I approached like I remember looking at my bank account and my stomach dropping like I felt sick to my stomach because at that point I can no longer make excuses for this guy I can no longer you know sugarcoat this and make this you know I can't be in denial anymore so I message him And he admits in a roundabout way, I took some of it, but meet me and I'll give you some of your, I'll give you the money back. And so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to deal with this when I get back home. Um, At that point, I mean, it'd only been three months, but I was already feeling a little bit trapped and scared because of the manipulation. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go to Memphis. He's going to stay at my house and watch my cats, which looking back at it, I'm horrified that I let him stay there knowing what I knew. And I, he picked me up from the airport 
the whole time I was in Memphis, he was interacting normally with me. He was sending p- me pictures of my animals. Um, I wasn't getting any weird vibes. Um, but I came home and it was really weird. Like my, my mattress, he took my mattress out of my room for some reason and like put it on the floor and was like sleeping on it in the living room for some reason. All of my drawers were gone, gone through and it was like no attempt was made to hide it. Like I used to keep my diaries in a certain clothing drawer and all those clothes were pulled apart. Like they weren't folded. My underwear drawer was just completely ransacked. Um, everything in my house, my nightstand drawers, my second bedroom that I was using for storage, all my boxes, all my personal stuff just gone through. And um, I had a special hiding spot for my wedding band from when I was married. And I went to look for it and it was gone. And I messaged him and I asked him just out outright, like, where's my wedding band? And again, the gaslighting, well, you must have taken it out and misplaced it um, because I used to take it out and clean it once in a while or whatever. I bought that wedding band for myself. So like I intended to take the jewels out of it and do something nice with it for myself because it was a lot of carrots. And um, he's like, I'll come back and help you look for it. It's fine. And and then he never showed up. He didn't. Um, I'm, I'm at this point panicking because the one item of value I really have is missing and I'm, I'm kind of blowing up his phone and I come up with this idea that, okay, I'm going to pretend like this isn't bothering me. I'm going to ask him to come have dinner with me and I'm going to try to convince him to give me my ring back. He's like, okay, yeah, I'll come tomorrow. And then he never comes. And that's, that was the day that the stuff started to get weird and creepy. What did he do next? So I just decided that um, I'm going to move on with my life. I was scared, but I was going to take action because there was still that missing key, right? And that Monday following the Sunday, he didn't come have dinner with me. I went to work and I lived in some apartments that I was also managing as a property manager. And I called the maintenance man who was my friend. I was like, you need to go to my apartment right now and change my locks. And before um, he had been able to go out and change the locks, I decided to go home on my lunch and check things out. And he had come to into my house because he still had some stuff there, not anything that would warrant coming in uninvited to somebody's house, you know, like t-shirts, some weights he had and taken them. And not only did he take stuff this is gross and I I mean I hate to even have to talk he like left something in my toilet for me (laughs) and I was like I don't know what statement you're trying to make but cool um and so I did get my locks changed and I don't think he counted on that because then I would see um I could tell I had a brand new lock set and I could see that it had already, somebody had started like trying to use a key or something. Um, So that scared me. So I got extra, I put alarms on my windows. Um, I put extra locks on the windows so that he couldn't get in. I had to get a bar to put in my sliding glass door. Um, and, And then he kind of went off the radar for just a little bit, at least from what I could tell. I didn't know at this point that he uh, had lots of Facebooks and was operating like underground to terrorize people. Um, So I started dating again and um, that is what set him off to start really coming out in the open. Um, He, there was a point when my new boyfriend was outside smoking and he was like, I swear that was him driving by. And every time I would come out, he would already be gone. So I couldn't verify or confirm. So it started with the driving by my house um, and slowing down and rolling his window down so he could like stare down. But my boyfriend at the time, he would just like stare him down. And um, of course, my boyfriend was just like, hi, like he was just like, whatever. But if it was like to me, it was creepy. Like I didn't want him even near me. 
Um, and I don't know exactly when it's, it went from the driving by. It wasn't that long after because I remember it was so new into my relationship with that I thought is going to be like, this girl has a crazy ex-boyfriend and I don't want any part of this. Um, uh, so it went from the driving by to um, making comments on Facebook. Uh, he had different accounts and he would comment things like on a public profile pictures, just calling me names like slut, whore, trying to get a rise out of me. It wasn't, those things didn't bother me. It felt like that was just immature, um, whatever. Uh, but one thing that did really start to bother me was the phone calls. I started getting so many phone calls late at night that my phone would actually like freeze. I couldn't, I couldn't even pick up the phone to call the cops. I was trying to call the cops and he was calling over and over and over and over. I mean, I just pulled out my case file to look at, to refresh my memory. It's like this thick. And most of those are screenshots of phone calls coming in. And um, I started to get really angry. And when I would answer and um, talk, he would be, he would have a voice changer but I knew it was him and I would be yelling at him and I'd be like, you know, come over. And like, <laughs> I would just like be so angry. I'd be like, let's just, uh, you know, let's talk about this. Let's figure it out. Why don't you just leave me alone? And f was like, you can't answer. And you're just, I didn't know it at the time, but I know now I was giving him exactly what he wanted. I know now that stalkers want you to answer they want you to give them attention you're feeding into it and um i didn't know it then i just wanted i felt so ashamed and so embarrassed and hopeless that i wanted to fight i'm not a kind of girl that sits down and doesn't fight back um i just didn't know how to fight back appropriately was this harassment daily he has even to this day, periods, I would say, where it's pretty incessant, it's constant, and then nothing. So it would be like where I'd get the daily phone calls. And when I finally stopped learning, when I learned to finally stop answering the phone, he would leave the voicemails. He would leave voicemails of Chucky laughing. Um, he would use vo the voice changer to whisper death threats. Um, he, that was when I started learning about the other fake Facebooks. They would be kind of variations of his name. Um, and it would come like out of nowhere. And it was so terrifying. I mean, the pictures he would make for these Facebooks were like the Grim Reaper, for example. And he'd come in and um, send like Hannibal Lecter or quotes about dying and death and, um, all of these things. And it just, it broke me to the point that I did start to call the cops and I did, was not met with much help or reception. They kind of gave me some advice, like take notes, take screenshots, um, keep making reports. So there's a paper trail. So I would keep picking up the phone, keep calling. And then that, that night in particular, that got really bad where he was leaving the voicemails with like Chucky and all of that. Um, and he had called so many times. I did get an officer on the phone, but they would not come to my house. And that was when I think they started my case file because I could reference that number when I called them. And that was the night that he came and started knocking on the door. And it was um, that it was to, to have witnessed it, like was there with me and he was scared. He would not go to the door. He wouldn't let me go to the door. He was like, you, he's out there and you can't, we have to stay back here, like away from the door. I mean, and rightfully so. He had pictures on his Facebook. His cover page was AK-47s and all of these guns. And he, you know, that was another thing when I was dating him, he would kind of go on to these anti-government rants, like the kind of stuff you hear from people who go and do mass shootings. He was very anti-government. He was very anti-authority. That was like the things I was learning about him as I was dating is what scared me when we weren't together. I knew this is a person who doesn't respect authority. He doesn't care about the law. 
I knew he had gone to jail when I was dating him, but I didn't learn until after that it was for stalking behavior and assaulting a woman. Um, so I started doing what I had to do. I start learning what I have to learn. I start reaching out to ex-girlfriends. I start pulling public records. I had printed out all the, all the restraining orders against him because there was multiple at that point. Um, and you can pay money to read the, um, the statement that you have to attach with your restraining order. Um, I printed it out and I still have a copy. The girl says the same thing and knew I was gone. He came into my house and he smashed her TV and destroyed her house. And she got a, she was granted a no contact order. There was also one from his ex-girlfriend and uh, that was a different county. So I couldn't read it. So I reached out to her on Facebook. I messaged her. I got her name off the, the website and I reached out to her. And she's the one who told me, um, you know, the story about why he really went to jail for a year. They had a no contact order and in front of a police officer, he assaulted her. So he was taken into custody. Um, she also told me about his hobby of making Craigslist ads for, um, for women that he have hurt his feelings or slighted him. And this did happen to me. It's really, really creepy. So I went to a Luke Bryan concert. Here's a backstory. And, um, a guy that was sitting next to me made a missed connections ad and I thought it was funny. So I posted about it. And the same day that I posted about that, um, and I said on the post that I was going to go on a date with the guy. That's when the Craigslist ad making me an escort came out. And I posted about it on Facebook. I said, um, my phone was blowing up. People were sending me nude pictures. They were telling me they knew where I lived. Again, this is before I dated. Um, so I had no idea who this could have been, but I knew it was somebody on my Facebook friends list because they took pictures of me that only my friends could see. They were pictures of me in a bikini in New York City or, you know, in New York. And so I knew it was somebody on my friends list. And um, I make a post, oh my God, you guys help me report this Craigslist ad. Somebody made this fake thing, <laughs> commented and said, oh, it's probably a jealous guy. And then fast forward to us breaking up and I talked to his ex-girlfriend and she goes, every time he'd get mad at me, he'd make a fake Craig Craigslist ad about me being an escort and I had to change my phone number. So I started connecting the dots. What was your reaction when you first found out that he was stalking other people in your Facebook group? So that came out because um, I was getting all of my information and I did get a no contact order. So I made a post that said, it is illegal for him to contact you about me. I need you to tell me if contacts you. like." no shame in my game. I put his name out there. I laid it out. I told the people he stole from me. I just said it, put it all out there because I felt like I feel very alone and I'm going to bring my people in. Right. And that was when the women started coming forward. A girl I went to high school with, I'm not like super close with her, but I was pretty close friends with her best friends. And they started messaging me and they were telling me he's been stalking her um, at this point, we graduated in 2006. At this point, it's 2016. It's been 10 years. They're telling me he still shows up on her work caller ID. He still drives by her parents' house. Um, he's been doing this creepy stuff to her for 10 plus years. And um, just he doesn't, he doesn't relent. It's, it's been years and he still does it. And anybody that is connected to her, he targets them. And the same thing ended up happening with me and my friends. Can you tell us about getting the no contact order? Yeah. So I am, um, like I said, I wasn't very successful with law enforcement. Um, one woman officer told me before I obtained the no contact order, that I should delete my social media and move out of state. Um, 
And that was when I was really discouraged. I felt like if these are my only options, I'm in for a really long road because, you know, I'm learning that this guy is stalking women for 10 plus years and a woman of the law is telling me I have no choices. I don't have anything I can do because he operates with anonymity. I have no proof. And I was like, well, I'm going to find a way to prove it. And I'm going to basically force you to help me. So um, that's exactly what I did. And I, I downloaded an app that will unblock phone numbers. And he was stupid enough to call me from his mom's landline. So once I unblocked that number, I was able to screenshot the hundreds of phone calls coming in. And then I paid like a dollar to pull up the profile that goes along with that phone number to show it's his mom's house. Like they have the same name or last name. So I started just gathering evidence. I started taking all the screenshots of the phone calls. I started every fake Facebook that came up. I wrote down the name and um, took screenshots of the comments or the messages. I started with a timeline and I had such exact notes like you know, it was like May 15th at 2 p.m. He did this under this fake Facebook and this. I mean, and there it was just so much evidence by the time I went in there. There was no way that this judge could tell me no. But what I didn't know when I filed it, because I have I inevitably ended up getting an attorney. But before I had, I did all the research to get my own restraining order. So in Washington, we have different levels. There's like the ones where they can't contact you. And then there's the one where it's actually a protection order where they cannot talk to you. They cannot talk to your friends. They cannot try to pass on third party messages, um, nothing. And that was the one I went for. So I, I compiled a huge list of my evidence and I went and I filed it at the courthouse, not knowing until after that he's going to get a copy of all of this. So they granted me a temporary restraining order. And in the meantime, they're working on serving him papers. And the mental anguish that I went through was horrific, waiting for him to be served these papers. Because at that point, it was too late for me to take it back. Um, I would have probably filed a little bit differently. I would have X'd out names of people who gave me testimony. Um, It was so bad that I ended up going to the ER one night because I was having such severe anxiety. Um, And I would check his Facebook incessantly. I couldn't do my job. I was just sitting there looking because I knew if he got served, he was going to lash out. And I was waiting for potentially life-threatening consequences for standing up for myself um and I actually had a a conversation with another cop he said you know there's just not enough here and I was like what do you mean there's not enough here I said you know what's gonna happen I'm going to die and you're gonna say it was a tragedy and something should have been done and I'm giving you all of this information and you're not helping me and I said he will kill me I believe that if I'm ever alone on a road with him and he can get away with it, he will kill me. Who was the first person you told when all this was going on? I finally, aside from my boyfriend who was experiencing it firsthand and the girls on Facebook, I finally came out to my parents and they're the ones who hired an attorney to help represent me because they could see how badly it was affecting me. And, um, they knew that I couldn't handle going to court and possibly facing him by myself. So I was, I had a lot of support from my um, family and I had my Facebook. I know that a lot of them were just acquaintances from school, but it was really empowering to see them rally around me. People would check up on me. Um, Guys that I'm just friendly with would be like, if you need someone to walk you to your car, whatever you need, like I'm here because I was very open with my story. And I know a lot of women choose not to be, but I 
I needed to know that I wasn't by myself because the minute that I started to let the mental games get a hold of me, that was when I started to decline. And I started to feel like I'm just going to roll over and I'm just going to accept that this is my life now. And so I can't even put like a number on the amount of people that helped me. Tell us about setting up the Facebook group. Well, that started really because there was girls in that group that I had used their words to help build my case. And I was like, I'm just going to corral these girls and tell them because it was totally unintentional. I didn't want to bring anybody else into it, but I needed to show probable cause that I'm in trouble with this guy, right? Like something's wrong. So um, it's it instead of being like kind of an uh, all of us pooled together, it was more like and still is to this day a chain um, where he would pop up and one of us would alert one and then like telephone, we boom, boom, boom down the line so that we could be prepared. Um, and it's, it's crazy because it's like, even to this day, the chain is growing. Women from my high school and from my hometown of Puyallup just two days ago messaged me about him. And I love that we have each other's back. We don't allow him to get any further anymore. The minute a fake Instagram comes up, screenshot, send it to the girls, block him, he's back. We're stopping him in his tracks. Like he can try and we are not giving him any traction. And that was because I was just like, I felt for his first victim. I was like, I'm going to let her know every chance I get. I'm going to give her some warning that this is coming. And that's when it started. And so it's been going strong now for, what, five years? So you've become friends with his other victims, essentially. Definitely. Like, I already had that kind of acquaintance um, thing going with them because I'd gone to the same schools as them. Um, And originally, the ex-girlfriend, when she saw that I had started dating him, she deleted me. And I was like, that's weird, thinking... I don't, I mean, now it makes total sense. After the fact, I messaged her and she was like, I'm sorry. I just, I can't have any connection to him. I can't. And she's, I just feel so sorry for her. I asked her if she wanted to come testify at my court hearing and have her voice be heard and have her story told. And I get it when people don't want to. It was terrifying to do it. It feels like you're a moving target. And it feels like when you do use your voice that you're now, a bigger moving target. You're like, you know what I mean? But I actually am not, I have no regrets that I did it the way I did because I learned after we broke up, he'd been stalking me for months. Um, I, it just, all of the evidence started coming out. Um, a fake Facebook that had harassed me before I dated him. They, that fake Facebook of his started harassing my male friends after and it's sickening. You like you're sitting there minding your own business and you get a screenshot of your male friend saying, "I'm getting death threats from this Facebook." And you open it up and look at it, and it's the Facebook that was harassing you before you dated him. I literally just like my Facebook post where I was coming out that I'm being stalked, I literally said I was sleeping with the enemy. I I let my worst nightmare into my house willingly. And it's so hard to not have guilt and shame um, because you can be as smart and prepared as you want to be, but they will find a way to infiltrate your life. And, and he's very creative. He finds a way to make, try to make himself relevant even today. Has anyone else in your group filed charges against him or gone to court against him or anything like that? So my friend, who I won't use her name, but she's been a part of the original group. Uh, She was very close friends with the original girlfriend in high school. So she's known all about the history. And um, she, for some reason, the last few years has really been getting the, she's been getting it really bad. He's really targeting her. And I truly feel sorry and believe that it's because I used her name and she had a lot of powerful things to say that helped my case. And I think he's real mad about that. I don't think he knew what to do because 
Yeah, other girls had gotten restraining orders, but I came out hard. I got an attorney. I got a two-year restraining order, which isn't, um, it's not normal here. Like, you usually get a year, um, but he gave, the judge gave me two, and he made it stricter. He made it so I couldn't go to my school, which is a big campus in Puyallup. He couldn't go to, on my street, which I found out later he was breaking that anyways, but, um, so I told her, I said, he did leave me alone and he doesn't like women that fight back he wants somebody that's easy to prey on so fight back and go get a restraining order and she did and I feel bad that it did but I'm glad that more people are standing up to him going through everything that you've gone through with him what would you like to see happen at this point I would like to see not only for my case and my friends that are tortured by this I want to see law enforcement take it serious. I want to see a lot of reform on cyber stalking laws. Cyber stalking can almost be scarier than when he drives by my house because when I have eyes on him, I know what he's doing. I can, if he's on my street, I know I can run away from him. The way it feels being cyber stalked is like if you've ever swam in the ocean and you have that feeling that there's like a predator underneath you, but you don't know, is it in your head? Is it real? Are you in a dangerous situation? That's what it feels like to be cyber stalked. And that kind of mental anguish will break somebody. I mean, there was a long period of time where I was so scared of everything Um, And people don't deserve to live like that. Like, I might not have been the smartest person, but I didn't deserve to have my life taken into someone else's hands. And I didn't deserve to have to, you know, go to such extreme measures to try and protect myself. Like, I always had to have a private account. Everything had to be completely locked down. And I hate that because I have a lot of things to share with the world. I'm a big advocate for recovery. I'm a big feminist. I have a lot of things to say. And I always had to kind of quiet myself because, again, I didn't want to draw attention to myself. And that was really hard for me to do. So I want women to be able to call the cops and for them to take it serious. I don't care if your police department is understaffed or if you don't believe her, which I don't know why we're not very believed, or if it's um, a Facebook and you can't prove it's him. You have detectives for a reason. You have technology. Find an IP address. Do whatever you need to protect these women because some of us are ending up dead. Do you want to see him go to jail for what he's done to you? Do you want to see him get mental help? Are you okay with just a restraining order? What do you want to see happen for him? I don't know that there's help for him. If I thought that, because I am also a big mental health advocate, if I thought that could go to therapy and fix his ways, I would say send him to a mental hospital. But he is a sociopath. There's no doubt in my mind that he will end up doing something and there is no place else he deserves to be than jail. And um, that's not only for punishment, but for protection. He's got, he's already gone to jail for assaulting a woman. He hasn't relented at all in stalking and terrorizing people. And um, these women deserve peace. They deserve to be able to pick up their phone and not be afraid they're getting a notification from him. And I think if he's put away, that there would be a lot of women sleeping better at night. What advice do you have for someone else that's being stalked in this way? I think the important thing is to first get support, um, lean on people, get professional help, talk about it. Um, When you let it sit inside of you, it becomes so much harder to deal with. So... Even if you're not as comfortable screaming from the rooftops like me, find somebody that you can trust and rely on to help you. Document everything, even if you think it's little or if they use a Facebook that's not in their name. It doesn't matter because what you're doing is you're showing a pattern of events and you're showing a pattern of how this person communicates so that can easily be proven that this is the same person. Um, You can't rely on, I hate to say it, but you can't rely on anybody else to prove your case. You have to prove it. You have to document everything. I had to spend money. I had to get an attorney. I had to buy apps. I had to, you know, do what I had to do. But um, 
just f keep fighting and what they want is for you to be an easy target and don't be. Let them know that you're not going to be one of the ones that sits back quietly and lets them come and run your life. How can someone use social media to combat a stalker? I know that it varies case by case. Um, a lot of them want attention, I feel like, but I think they want attention in the fact that you cry and beg them to leave them alone. I don't think they want to be exposed for who they are, and I don't think they want the world to know how they operate. And so for me, using Facebook to tell my story and to expose this person, that is when all of these women, they now have a place to go to and they have support in numbers. And that whole town of Puyallup, that the graduating class, I don't think there's a person that hasn't heard about him and what he's done. And it might protect a girl in the future. It might make somebody feel comfortable enough to come forward. So using your voice on social media, not to interact with them and encourage them, but to be strong for yourself and get the support that you need. That's the way that I use it. It's just like any other thing that you advocate for. If you feel strongly about something, I use Facebook the same way for that type of thing. And it's like, I don't really talk about it a lot anymore, but um, now that this has come up and I'm researching the file again and everything, I have, you know, I have thought more about it because when this first happened to me, I did open up an official nonprofit to help women because it was kind of confusing to fill out a no contact order petition and court websites and, you know, things like that. Like, luckily, I'd been to court a lot for my job, so I kind of knew my, the ins and outs of the system. But if you didn't and you don't have cops helping you and you don't have people that know, you know, there isn't help. So I use Facebook for that, too. Like, and a lot of, not a lot, but people would recommend me. And I helped some women through the process. Where is your stalker now? Is So the protection order did expire, um... And I didn't, I had moved out of county, so I did not go back to uh, re um, get it extended, um, mostly because the stuff that he has come out with the last few years have been pretty far and few in between when it comes to me. Um, and I don't feel afraid anymore. I feel pretty confident that I've made my point clear to him that I am not going to be the person. If you show up here, I will use the full force of the law. And if they don't believe me, I will make sure that they listen to me. So um, I'm about 100% sure he still lives with his mom in our hometown, still doing the same thing. And um, would I be afraid if I saw him in person? Yeah. But I think that the person I am today is a lot stronger and a lot less fearful, and I think I would be able to handle it. How has your life changed from all of this? Well, one thing is I definitely took time to research people before I dated them. I have it saved on my laptop how to look up people's names in the court system. Um, I do not second guess my intuition anymore because if I had listened to that little warning bell the first time, I wouldn't be where I am. So I don't discredit myself anymore. And um, I do look over my shoulder a lot more, but I think that just comes with the territory. I think you just grow into it and you learn how to accept that you're a victim of stalking and there might be a threat. Um, but like I said, it's kind of like the, a grieving process. Like it never gets easier, you know, but you learn to live with it. And um, just like any other hardship, you, you find strength in it and you find that you've learned a lesson from it. Brianne, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It was really therapeutic to tell my story and talk about it. And I hope other women get something out of it as well. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone out there is in need of help or is a victim of stalking, please reach out. You can find a list of resources on our Instagram at Strictly Stalking Pod. You can watch all of our episodes at youtube.com slash Strictly Stalking Pod. I'm Jake Deptula. And I'm Jamie Beebe. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Strictly Stalking. Strictly Stalking.